So why is the monetary cycle of usury inherently terminal? It is inherently terminal because the currency is not purely a medium of exchange, because the value of the currency is inherently diminished across the lifespan of a purported central banking system, and most of all, because this intentionally obfuscated privatized currency comprises an obligation to deflate the circulation of principal and interest while the circulation is comprised only of the principal. In other words, at all times, these intentionally usurious currencies comprise obligations to pay more out of circulation than exists in circulation even to continue to fulfill initial or original obligations then, we must maintain a vital circulation by replenishing it of what is paid out of it, or we cannot fulfill even the initial obligations, which the perpetual replenishing only multiplies further. To the predominant and determinate practical extent, we are thus obliged to maintain a vital circulation by reborrowing so much as the periodic principal and interest that we are perpetually paying out of a circulation comprised of the principal. What we pay against principal, therefore, is reborrowed as new debt equal to the former debt it would otherwise resolve. Paying down one debt, therefore, only requires assuming another merely to continue servicing the sum of debt, making it impossible to this extent to pay the sum of debt down. What we pay against interest, however, counts none against an existing sum of debt, and thus whatever periodic interest we must reborrow to maintain a vital circulation perpetually increases the sum of debt. So long as we can succeed in maintaining a vital circulation then, the sum of debt inherently increases at an inherently escalating rate of ever greater sums of periodic interest related to an ever greater sum of debt. Because this simultaneous deflation and reflation of the circulation multiplies debt in proportion to the vital circulation, ever more of a given circulation is dedicated to servicing debt. Thus, ever less of the circulation can be devoted to sustaining industry even as industry is saddled with this escalating sum of debt. Ultimately, then, this process of replenishing a circulation of the periodic costs of servicing debt produces such a sum of debt as exceeds the finite capacity to service its ever-escalating proportions which in turn destroys our creditworthiness to borrow further, as yet remains necessary to maintain the vital circulation as we make the last fatal payments of debt service out of the general circulation. As the costs of servicing the escalating sum of debt thus inevitably encroach upon our ability to sustain necessary industry, we enter a terminal phase of a finite life cycle in which industry fails at an escalating rate under the diminishing portions of the circulation which can be devoted to sustaining industry. The destroyed industry in turn cannot contribute to maintaining a circulation against the further irreversible escalation of debt, and so eventually the process of maintaining the circulation imposes such a sum of debt that industry fails monumentally, the circulation disappears, and creditworthiness to replenish the circulation is thereafter impossible. Because these resultant conditions persist, we have utter artificial failure. The failure is wholly artificial because nothing but the obfuscated and intended adverse nature of the currency imposes failure. No natural cause of failure whatever exists. Neither exhaustion of natural resources or cessation of our willingness or capability to render production from those resources is at fault. In other words, we only suffer such a failure for failing to understand the adverse nature of the pretended money. 
Let's step through all this visually so that we can readily understand that while it's supposed to work, this imposed system can only work against us. Data on the left side of our demonstration application relates to conventional central banking systems. Right side data relates to mathematically perfected economy, which we will later show together. Horizontal bars 1 and 2 of the graph represent the circulation and debt of a conventional banking system. So that proportions are readily understood, demonstrations are based on a hypothetical initial circulation of 100 units. On the left hand side, the model handles periodic rates of debt service together with industrial requisites. Our model also has the power to project the upward and lower potentials or bounds of so-called stimulus programs. Color-coded values match the proportions illustrated in the bar graphs. Yellow represents principal, orange is interest. The sum of periodic interest and principal is represented in the yellow-orange beige row. A minimal proportion of circulation capable of sustaining intended industry is indicated in the lavender row and portion of the circulation bar graphs. Examples use a regular hypothetical 35 units of circulation. Free or liquid circulation above the requisites of industry and debt service is indicated by the lime green portion of the circulation graph. So we see the circulation and its bar graph here with periodic principle, yellow, interest, orange, and sustained industry, lavender, overlaid. Debt is indicated by red in the data and bar graph. Periodic principle, yellow, and interest, orange, likewise are overlaid. So, at any moment of the demonstrations, vital proportions of sustainability of principal, interest, industry, and liquid circulation are displayed in respect to their makeup of the circulation. Comparisons to mathematically perfected economy will show mathematically perfected economy data on the right, with debt corresponding to the upper bar 4, and circulatory vitals again indicated within bar 3. Now that we can identify the parts of our model, we are prepared to understand it as it walks us through multiplication of debt by interest, eventual encroachment of debt on the sustainability of industry, and inevitable collapse of the purported economy. We will thus be able to watch and understand degeneration of the system into a terminal phase and walk through that terminal phase to and beyond utter systemic failure. To understand the culminating terminal process, you will largely want to focus on the circulation and debt bars, noting the overlaid portions of each. Yellow again is periodic principle requirements. Orange represents periodic interest requirements. The full 35 units of the lavender industrial sector must be sustained to sustain intended industry. Free circulation above these requisites will be left over, represented by the remaining lime green portion of the circulation bar graph. In the debt bar graph, again we see the yellow principal and orange interest portions overlaid. 